Blessings and salutations. I'm Prophet Zion Matthew from Zion Matthew International, Durban, South Africa. And I'm so blessed today to invite you to be part of the world's greatest revival academy called the Unleashed Revival Academy. It is an online school, a 12-week course. It's going to be phenomenal. We're covering three different subjects on the kingdom, the power, and the glory. This is the first three of several modules that we'll be running, but this course is running for 12 weeks and you can be part of it anywhere in the world. If you have an internet connection, access to Facebook, access to email, then you can also be part of this phenomenal course. We have had several courses like this around South Africa with phenomenal results. People's lives were changed, people's hearts are renewed, people have been set on fire with the Holy Ghost and a fresh passion for revival and reformation in the Kingdom of God. We discuss what is the Kingdom of God, what is the mandate of the Kingdom of God and the power of God. We discuss aspects like spiritual, uh, spiritual fatherhood, we discuss aspects like prophecy, uh, how to prophesy, how to discern the Spirit of God, how to lay hands on the sick and see them recover and in the glory of God. We cover the rhapsody of revival we cover the different waves of the Holy Spirit that has been sweeping to the earth for the last 500 years all the way from Martin Luther right to where we are now you don't want to miss this you want to be part of this course it's live we have recorded this in a live class with live students and their lives were touched and changed forever by the power of the Word of God and I am inviting you to be part of the Unleashed Revival Academy starting in the first week of March 2020 you still have an opportunity to register now early bird registrations get a discount off their course contact us the details on the bottom of the screen email us and we will send you all the details and all that you need to know of how you can be part of the Unleashed Revival Academy at the end of the course you will also receive a certificate of completion as you join thousands of other students around the world that has joined the Unleashed Revival Academy come be empowered be ignited with this amazing phenomenal course you're going to experience the kingdom the power and the glory of God I'm Prophet Zion Matthew I'm looking forward to seeing you being part of this world-changing, life-altering course that's going to change your life, empower your ministry, and set you on a trajectory for supernatural change. The class of Valedictorian for the class of 2019, the award goes to Pastor Vanessa Blessings and salutations, awesome sons of God. It's Saturday night. I'm Prophet Zion Matthew, and we are broadcasting live on Facebook right here from Durban, the city of revival on the east coast of South Africa. It is a place where God is moving and God is speaking. Let the prophet speak. And tonight, I know all of you have been blessed this entire week as we have had guests from all over the nations of the earth. I see United States in the house. I see Singapore in the house. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Cape Town, Durban, Namibia is in the house. I see people from around the world um, in the house tonight. And we are so excited to be sharing what the Lord is saying in this season. We got to be a people who has our finger on the pulse of what God is saying in our generation. We don't want to be behind God. We don't want to be ahead of God. We want to be right where the presence of the Lord is. And as you always know, before I start my broadcast and bring in my guests, I always read a small excerpt from my book called Emerge. And I want you to listen to this. We are seeing all over the earth that God is raising tag teams of prophets and apostles. And I thought that this was just a time for the prophets of God to take their place. But God is saying in the season that he is raising up a double-edged sword. The double-edged sword is the prophet and the apostle. And it is through the union of these two ministry gifts that God is ushering in a tide that is changing the world forever. When we declare a shift, come on, somebody say shift. Somebody say shift. When we declare a shift in the Kronos natural time, natural time becomes subject to the Kairos time. And when we declare it, we do not declare it from earth to heaven. We declare it from heaven to earth. And everything, and I say it again, and everything is forced to align itself with the purposes of God. And I believe in the spirit realm, we are in the midst of a great transition. 
And this is the reason why many of you have entered into a season of great turbulence in your life. Prophetic, the prophetic brings definition to the times and the seasons of God. It's this reason that many of you are feeling the, the turbulence in your lives, in your ministry. And it's almost the feeling that nothing's wrong, but something is just not right. I'd rather be a tempting transition than live in stagnancy. I believe that the Lord is moving the church into the next dimension of its destiny. God said to Joshua, tell my people, mark this way, for you have not been this way before. I'd rather die, I'd rather die attempting entering a new dimension than dying in an old place. Joseph was so committed to this transition that he said, if I die in Egypt, just don't let my bones remain here. Take it with you into the next dimension. We have got to be so committed to transformation and change. We cannot forever camp just at revival. The Bible says after two days, I would revive you. But on the third day, I would raise you up. Lord wants us to understand that Hosea is trying to communicate that the day of revival has passed. That's the second day. That's the day of Pentecost. But God is bringing us into the third day. That is apostolic alignment. And God is raising up a people that will look like him and sound like him in this apostolic reformation. Revival has its purpose and it still does. But I believe prophetically that this next season, God is raising up a prophetic apostolic reformation in the earth that's going to change the culture, the landscape, and the prophetic outlook of the church and the world forever. Welcome again to all of you watching from around the world. Please share this broadcast tonight. It's going to be powerful. We have a phenomenal guest joining us. He's an apostle of God. Um, I connected with him a few years ago on Facebook. He's controversial. He is carrying a now word for this generation. He's carrying a now word, not only for South Africa. He is a homebred son of the soil, a son, a voice that God has raised up in our nation that is challenging the systems of the day. Reformers are challengers. Reformers do not accept status quo. Reformers always ask questions. And today we are so blessed to have with us the great man of God, Apostle Brandon Bailey from Johannesburg, South Africa. Would you put your hands together and welcome the man of God tonight, Apostle Brandon Bailey. Bless you, sir. Amen. Prophet Zion, thank you so much, man. That was such a crazy introduction. I was wondering who you're referring to. But, <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, thank you so much for having me on your platform and uh, making me part of what you are doing in this season, in this hour. I was just watching your introduction video and also read uh, the portion you were reading from your book, man. And I, I have to say that I concur. I think we're in such amazing times right now and that we are just ready to see what God will do in the coming days. Amen, amen, amen. Guys, continue to share this broadcast. Share it right now. Create a watch party. The man of God has a word from the Lord today. Uh, the Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And if we are going to transition and migrate into another season with God, we cannot migrate without a word. Man of God, what is the Lord laying on your heart today? Well, you know what? One of the things that, that I'm looking at in particular at this point in time is how things are unfolding. And one of the things that I've noticed as far as God is concerned, generally, when, when, when a crisis hits us, one of the things that God always say is be still and know that I am Lord. And, and again, it is so interesting to know that when crisis hits, the first thing that God wants us to recognize is his Lordship. And he says, be still, but recognize my Lordship. Because the tendency for us as a people in general is when we come into a season or in a shift or in a crisis like this, we tend to, to, to be very loud. We tend to get very noisy and we tend to be distracted by what's happening. And so the first thing that God does in seasons like this is God wants us to have a recognition of his Lordship. So he says, be still and know that I am Lord. So his Lordship must always be the precedence by which we build. The, the, it should always be the precedence that set things in motion. It should be the premise on which we build. We, you know, there's also in the book of Isaiah, when, when, when Isaiah makes a profound statement, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I yeah. saw the Lord and lifted up. And it is so interesting that when crisis hits, the first thing that God wants us to recognize is not what, what's happening, how the winds are blowing. It is to recognize his Lordship. Because mm. generally, 
we renegotiate the lordship of God during a time of crisis and without his lordship. So I think our posture at this point in time should not necessarily be to bombard people with noise, but first to let people know that the Lord is still in charge. The Lord is still high and lifted up and that his throne is still exalted far above anything uh, that we can imagine or think. So it must be a recognition of his lordship. And when there's a recognition of his lordship, then there's also the download because now we understand who's, who's speaking or whose voice is supreme to the circumstances whose voice should be louder than what we are hearing so he says you in crisis but first and foremost recognize that i am still lord because crisis does not displace me crisis does not remove me there must be a recognition of my lordship in these times absolutely sir and i believe that the bible says like the sons of Ithaca, we got to understand the season and the time where in. if we misappropriate a season, if we misunderstand or diagnose the time and the moment that the church is finding itself in, we will miss the point that heaven is trying to release in this time. And if we miss the point, and like the Lord said to Joshua, mark this way because you have not walked this way before. So if God is ushering us into a new era in the realm of the spirit, the, and this new era has not been, uh, uh, we have not endeavored to walk this path before. So in the realm of the spirit, we've got to begin to obtain fresh mandates of scrolls from heaven so that we will be able to plot out and navigate the way forward. And the Bible says, uh, you know, when every time we are about to break into a, a new season, a new era, a new time in the realm of the spirit, um, it's always turbulent in the natural. Um, I've read an article that says that planes, airplanes, when they're traveling between seasons, when, they, when they're leaving one season and one part of the hemispheres to move into another season, it's that at that time that those planes experience the most turbulence. And I believe in the realm of the spirit, turbulence announces a changing, a migration uh, uh, of a timeline in the realm of the spirit. And, and, and I believe that God is allowing us in this time, uh, people, prophets are speaking about the reset. People are speaking about uh, God setting things back in order to the original blueprint that he has had. And I believe as the prophet of God in this time that many times uh, God tried to interject the, the motions of what we call church to be. God tried to interject it, but our programs were so tied up and we were so locked into what we were busy with that we missed God. So many times God interjects our timeline. He interjects our, chron our chronological timeline so that he could impart and re um, Fertilate, uh, refer, uh, re, you know, to, to bring something brand new from heaven yeah. to stop the contamination that is in the earth. Man of God, what is the what is the sense in the realm of the spirit about the new uh, thing that we're about to enter in this time? Yeah. Well, well, let me start off and just go back to something that you've just mentioned there. One of the things we have to be absolutely clear on as well is that the crisis is not necessary. The, the crisis is more or less the climax of what God set in motion probably from 2014, 2015, 2016. And the crisis is the climax. Now, what a lot of people don't understand about crisis is that a precedence for a move of God is first his word. It is yes. first his word that sets the precedence for his move. But when there is, when we deliberately ignore his speaking, God will then allow crisis to arise so that he can draw our attention to old conversations. And so it is very important that we understand that, that crisis is not a precedence for a move of God. It is his right. word. Crisis is what he uses when we continue to ignore his speaking and his word. You look yes. at a scripture, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, Go and be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But then you open up and you read Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And Acts chapter 8 verse 1 says, And a great persecution arose in Jerusalem. Mm. And the church had to flee to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Right. Now, the precedence for their movement was the word. Go and be witnesses. He gave the word. But when they ignored the word, God yes. allowed the persecution to arise so that they can honor the word. And so you are absolutely right when you say sometimes turbulence and these movements usher us into something, which by default means that if we are not obedient to the speaking of God, God will allow situations right. to arise force our obedience because a precedence for a move of God is always his word. But when his word is ignored, he will mm -hmm. allow Christ to come to sort of force our hand because the problem with us is in comfort and in, in and inconvenience, we are generally very 
reluctant to act upon the word mm-hmm. of God. Sometimes God will cause a shaking to say, I spoke to you five years ago. I spoke right. to you three years ago. I spoke to you six years ago. Mm-hmm. And you deliberately ignored me or you were so comfortable that you missed my speaking. And so we must understand that when God speaks, there must be obedience. But man in his very nature does not operate like that. Man right. in his very nature needs something to shake them, something to rock them, uh, something to push them a bit. And I believe that this crisis is taking us back to old conversations. You know, I'm, I'm a student of history prophetic pronouncements. 2010, for example, a father of the faith on this continent, Bishop Tura Busma, who's quite well known, he said that between 2010 and 2020, this will be the decade of emergence, the, the title of your book as well. And, and I believe that is something I saw. You wrote a book about it because most of us were consistent with that word. But what a lot of people don't understand is that even if we announce that it's a decade or a season of emergence, there must be the deliberate act from the different fathers, the different levels, the different ranks to usher in that move of God. So we can have a prophetic pronouncement and still not be obedient to participate in that. Mm. And so I believe what God is doing now is God gave us an accurate word, but our participation in the word Mm. was lacking. And God now causes crisis to sort of force our participation. And what we are seeing now is that, yes, it was the decade of emergence, but the problem was we were so slow in placing our hand upon it. And Mm. John in Gospels give us a context. John, when Jesus comes on the scene, he knows Jesus needs to emerge and he needs to step back. And John makes a profound statement. John says, I must decrease so that Mm. he can increase. Yes. And, and, and what John literally meant that it was not just something that's facilitated in some spiritual realm. It's not just something abstract. It is mm. something that he should be intentional about in terms of withdrawing a bit so that mm. he can give Jesus the platform. He can give Jesus the stage and he can allow Jesus to increase. And so when he makes that statement, he's talking about his his role in making right. that happen, his role in endorsing what's emerging, his role in, in, in placing his hand on what's emerging. And I think that is what we have missed. And now we've come to a place of crisis. And in a place of crisis, one of the things that you particularly pick up as far as the prophetic and the apostolic is concerned, you will see that there's a clear distinction between sermonology and a word of the Lord. Right. There's a clear distinction between sermonology and the word of the Lord. And so most of us are masters of sermonology. We can come on a platform and we can give you our three points of, let me speak about love today. Love means agape, love means this, love means that. But what we are seeing now is that there's no place or no platform for sermonology. What people are wanting now is the word of the Lord. But here's the thing, the word of the Lord has been available for a decade. Mm. Come on. consistent for a decade. A lot of the Lord's been flowing for 10 years, but we missed it because in convenience, we tend to miss the speaking of God because we are drawn to what makes us comfortable, what is easy. And what I've witnessed over the period of this lockdown, since this thing has been announced, not just in the South African context, but in a global context, is that a lot of us have sermons, but we do not have the word of the Lord. Right. And it is in these circumstances where God now begins to elevate prophetic voices and he begins to uh, uh, give them more attention as far as their voice is concerned. And so when a prophet rises in the season, it, it's, it's not a season announcing him. It is just that crisis is forcing everybody to look at a sound that was available all the time. And so the prophetic was always available. We just missed it. We just ignored it. The word of the Lord was available all the time. We just missed it. We just ignored it because our comfort somehow created a context for us to exist without craving What is the Lord saying? And I believe what the season is causing now is it's drawing attention to old words, old conversations, the old speaking of God. Because what we need to understand as well is that crisis does not announce God. Crisis reveals what God's been saying all along. Events does not announce God. It reveals what God's been saying all along. And so it's a revelation of old conversation, but to many it is new because it's the first time that they are paying attention. attention. That's right. Absolutely, sir. And, and, And the book of Amos, prophet Amos prophesies, he says there will be a coming a day where there'll be a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. And people say, oh, but everyone's preaching. And you're absolutely correct because everybody's preaching. But who is carrying the word of the Lord in this season? And I I believe crisis does not announce the prophets, the true prophets. Crisis reveals the true prophets. Can I say it again? Crisis do not announce. And many times people, listen, what I'm preaching now, I've been preaching for the last decade. There's nothing new that we're preaching. We've, it's just now people are stopping and they say, this truly was the word of the Lord. 
for all the season and you are so correct. The Bible says that woe to him that is at ease in Zion. And I believe that the church has been in a place of ease and God is almost, the Bible says, yeah, I'm shaking everything that can be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. And I believe coming to the fore is the remnant voices in this time that actually he is um, in, on par and in tune with what heaven is saying. Because right now, I mean, we switch on uh, Facebook Lives a down a dozen. Every, and most of the people are still doing what they were always doing. People are, you, you will see it, you will see it, they're still doing. Some people are still doing church as they always did it. But I believe that when God announces a shift in the earth, it is an invitation. When God announces a shift, it's an invitation for heaven to invade the earth. It's an invitation for God's strategy to invade our strategy. It's an invitation for God's mind to invade our mind. And until we begin, like I said, John the Baptist had to step back. And sometimes the, the greatest impact we will have is in the step back that we take. And I believe that this time God is recalibrating us. That word recalibration in the original uh in the in, in the in the in the in the english dictionary it speaks about setting things the measuring line of the way things are measured to set it in the original order because some things got over the years has lost its calibration some things has lost its momentum and i believe that there is a brand new synergy between heaven and earth between the apostolic prophetic voice between what god is saying from heaven to earth and what the prophets and the apostles and the fivefold is releasing from the earth realm to the to the nations of the earth just speak a little bit about the prepared ones i know you god, god has been preparing people i believe for the last decade so in every generation before calamity came and we don't look to calamity as God's timeline, but we look to the word of God as God's timeline. But God has always prepared people, prepared the Esthers, he prepared the Deborahs, he prepared the Moseses that will become saviors and deliverers in their generation. And I believe that this time of preparation was so important for where we are now. I want you to talk a little bit about the preparation that God has uh, led us into the previous season. So, so before I get into that, just to come back to what you said about a prophet Amos, you said that, and, and you quoted Amos, where he says there will be scarcity of the word of Lord. We see the same play out in First Samuel chapter three, where the Bible opens up in verse one, and it says, "And in those days, the word of the Lord was scarce." And one of the things we have to understand about scarcity in, in that particular context is that scarcity is, is is what we experience when there's a transition between the old and the new, when there's a transition between an old revelation and a new revelation, uh, old wineskin and a new wineskin, because that chapter deals with the word of the Lord was scarce. But when you read it in its, you read the entire chapter and the following chapters, you would notice that there was also the, the, the Eli generation and the Samuel generation. Right. But, but it starts out with saying the word of the Lord was scarce. Now watch this. The word of the Lord was scarce in the hearing of Eli, but the word of the Lord was not scarce in the ear of Come Samuel. On. Come on. The word of the Lord was scarce in the ear of Eli. It was not scarce in the ear of Samuel. But here's the mistake that Samuel made. When, when the Lord calls him Samuel, he runs to Eli. And this mm. is the mistake that all generations tend to make. He runs to Eli because we always filter uh, the voice of the Lord with, our, with the dominant voices and the dominant dogma in our ear. Right. And so when God says Samuel, he hears his father's voice. He hears the voice of Eli. He hears the voice of the guy that has oversight over him. He hears the voice of the person that has mentored him over the years. And, 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 and a fundamental mistake that we make is that we hear the new speaking of God, but we try to filter the new speaking of God through, through the lenses of old dogma, of old strategies, of old patterns, of old methods. And, 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 and when he goes to Eli, Eli says, you know what? I perceive that I was not the one calling you. I perceive that it was the Lord calling you. And when he says that, Samuel now realizes that God is speaking to him. But what is crazy about that portion of scripture, and it's perhaps sensitive that we don't always want to deal with it because of the high level of sensitivity. What is crazy about that particular portion of scripture is that the Lord wants to speak to Samuel away from Eli. The Lord wants to speak to Samuel away from Eli. And God begins to give him a download and he now carries the message up. 
to the guy that's ranked higher than him, the guy that is above him, the guy that watches over him, and he carries that word forth to him. And, and, and Eli receives that as the word of the Lord, but also with a little bit of arrogance, because one of the things that we will experience when seasons are changing and seasons are shifting is that a clear and accurate speaking of God will always be judged by, 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 by people that have dominated the scene, people that have been on the forefront of the things of God. And that will always be received with a level of arrogance to a large extent. But, but to go also on to your point where you asked me about when God said, uh, when you asked me, how is God preparing them? Preparation always happens in isolation. And there are several things that is consistent with preparation. When God prepares a new generation, the one thing that God lays serious emphasis on, it is death to self. The one thing that God lays serious, serious emphasis on is the dying of self. It is death of self. Because what we tend to do when God begins to speak to us is the tendency for us is to exalt ourselves so far above everybody. The tendency for us is to place ourselves so far above everybody. And we begin to take the pure, authentic, unadulterated speaking of God. And we package it in such a way that we now monopolize the move of God. And so when God prepares a wineskin, when God prepares a people, the first thing that God does, and for most people that understand this in a prophetic context, is that God will spend years killing you. God will spend years dealing with your flesh, dealing with the sensitivities of your flesh, dealing with the sensitivities of your person. And, and God will deal with that. God will kill that. And so our appetites die in, in a season of preparation. Uh, the things that ministers to our flesh dies in a season of preparation. Uh, uh, the things that are so dear to us, uh, that we hold so dear, that ministers almost exclusively to the carnal aspect of our person. God starts addressing those things. God starts addressing those things. And you go through a season where you, where you have to ask yourself, why is nobody recognizing me? Uh, why is nobody calling me? Why is nobody seeing that I am a voice of God? Why do people not acknowledge that I can hear God, that I can speak for God, that I am a genuine man of God? Uh, sometimes that feeling is the flesh. And God addresses that so strong in a season of preparation. And you will notice everybody that ever became significant in the broader scope of what God was doing in the earth, they went through a season where they had to die to self. They went through a season where they had to die to self. And so preparation deals almost exclusively with dying to self. It deals almost exclusively with dying to self. And so you find that people have been under the radar. They've been in obscurity for five years, six, seven years, 10 years. And what's happening in that season? God is dealing with their flesh. Because if you get a stage of significance and you are not dead to self, you will monopolize the move of God and you will find justification in doing things that ministers to your flesh that are not necessarily spirit. And so God in preparation will deal with your flesh. This is why people that God has called to significance will go through a season where they feel they're not being recognized. They feel they're not being acknowledged. They feel that they put, they're doing everything right, but there's no fruit. There's no growth, there's no momentum, and that is their definition of it. But finally, when they come out of that season, they realize that they're in a place now where they're speaking for God and nothing can affect them. Nothing can touch them because they're a dead person. There's nothing that wakes up. There's no irritations that happens. When they don't get recognition, they can live with it because Amen. God killed them. The preparation phase deals primarily with dead to self. And in this season that we are entering in, God is giving the platform and the stage to people that have died to themselves. Mm. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Because, you, you know, we have, we have bred a church that is so in the flesh for the last 20 years, where that if someone's not prophesying, um, you're going to get a new car, you're going to get a new house. And, 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 and the church has been fed from junk food and, and we become, and, and every seed reproduces up its own kind. So what was fed to the church in the 90s and the early 2000s was this lukewarm um, Seek a sensitive Christianity. And now we are bred a generation. If someone's not calling up their name and their phone numbers and someone's not giving them what they ate last week, nobody's logging on to their Facebook Live. Nobody wants to watch them. Everybody wants to hear God's going to bless you. God's going to increase. We already know God's going to bless us. We already know the mind of God for us in the season. But the prepared ones are the ones that have already inclined their ear to the Lord himself. We already know that God is about, we know what the king is doing in his inner chamber. And those inner chamber people are about to emerge in this time. And they are the matured ones. Because the Bible says, Job says, I, want to go. I move forward, I try to find him. I move backwards, I try to find him. I move to the east and I move to the west and I try to find him. But when we found him, 
He found me and he put me through the fire. And when I emerged from that fire, I came out as pure gold. And I believe that these prepared ones, God is lifting the curtains on them and they are not coming out as Ephraim, the half-baked cake. They are not coming out just with a, a, an anointing to preach. They are coming out with the fullness of God. They're, all, they're not looking for recognition. These are not looking for titles. They're not looking for affirmation from men because they've already found the affirmation from the secret place. They, they are more interested in God knowing their name than man knowing their name. And you see much of what we have we received from other first world nations, many first world nations, we have seen the celebrity style ministry trying to invade our nation. But God is sending, uh, is sending a judgment on that kind of celebrity style ministry. That may have worked in the 70s and in the 80s. And God is reorganizing uh, the state of affairs that in this time there's going to be a resurgence of the prepared ones. And these prepared ones are, are, are gaining their And I say it like this, I don't want anything if I did not obtain that from the threshing floor. I don't Come want on. recognition if I did not uh, obtain yeah. that from the threshing floor. What is the point of everyone on this earth realm knowing yeah. that Zion and heaven doesn't know me? What is the point of everybody reading all our books, coming to all of our meetings, and heaven says, I don't know you. I do not recognize your frequency. You're operating in strange fire. And these prepared ones that God is saying will bring, a, a, will, will be able to, to, to say what is strange fire and what is holy fire. And I believe that God is raising these people up and they're going to be the distinct ones. You're going to look at them. They're going to be the marked ones that the book of Revelation speaks. They are marked with the mark of God on their foreheads. They are marked. They've been marked from the throne room. They carry an aroma that they come from They come from God. And let me tell you something. Not only are we speaking for God, not only will this remnant uh, prepared one speak for God, I believe that they will speak as God in this generation. There is one dimension to speak for him, but there's another dimension to speak as him. Because the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Mm -hmm. A prophet to you, man of God. Yeah, and, 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 and that's so profound, man of God. But the second phase also after dying to self is that once you have died to self, you are able to own your sound. Because one of the things that places immense pressure on us is the need mm -hmm. for acceptance. And so when God deals with you on the threshing floor, when God deals with you in the secret place and you don't get that recognition, the pressure on you to change your sound, to change what God is speaking to you is so strong. And you change that so that you can fit into what is trending and what is what people are, are buying into. And so mm. when God heals us, when we die to self, we are now also in a position where we are able to own our authenticity. And I Come said on. a few days ago on my live stream that the biggest challenge for this generation is conformity. Because conformity is what kills a sound. Conformity is what stifles a sound. Yeah. And, and, and what happens is if we come into an arena and we say, okay, they, they, they're buying those books because those books, are, they are, those are the books that are selling. What happens? You abandon what you know. You right. abandon what is authentic. You abandon what God deposited into your spirit, man. You abandon that and you change that so that you can gain acceptance, you can gain recognition. And so one of the ways that God protects authenticity when he prepares us in the secret place is we die to self. And that way you come out and you realize that I had to die for the sound. I right. had to die for this word. I had to die for this message. And I'm not willing to sell it cheaply. And so God protects authenticity in us through the process of killing us. Mm. Come yes, on. in us through the process of killing us and so what we will see uh, emerge now in in the coming years what we will see emerge in the coming years is is, is people that carry a distinct sound uh, it, it, it is the type of ministry where you see you know what i i, I can't fit him anywhere i, I look at mm. prophet zion and, and 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 i can't fit him he does not remind me of this one there's something different about him and it is their distinction it is their distinction that we will see gain recognition and, 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 and to a certain extent gain popularity because God wants to speak to his church. God mm -hmm. wants to speak to his church. And so I remember years ago when, when, when I started preaching and teaching in the church, one of the challenges for me was that I did not necessarily enjoy the response that, that, that a fire and brimstone evangelist would, for example, enjoy. You know, And I was like thinking, man, yeah. there's something wrong with me. And, and I could feel the pressure of saying, hey, man, let me try and, and do this. Let me right. <laughs> incorporate this. Let me change this a little bit. And, and I served under a very, very wise pastor. And he could see the pressure I had as a young man, uh, Pastor Alvin Durance. That's my pastor. 
And he called me one side and he said to me, Brandon, I can see you are under tremendous pressure mm. because when you come to church and you see how other, other guys, other preachers in the church are received for their sound, uh, you like that. But my son, remain or remain committed to what God has called you to do because your ministry is something we need. And I will never forget his word. And that sort of brought such an adjustment to me uh, in my personal space. Uh, it brought an adjustment to me mentally and it brought such an adjustment to me spiritually that I now got to a place where I was contending for my sound. I was protecting my sound. And, and even when the pressures came for acceptance, even when the pressure came uh, for me to belong and stuff, I said, no, 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 no. This man gave me wisdom. And years later now, by the grace of God, uh, God has used me in the nations on this continent to, to, to be an impactful voice uh, to a large extent. But what if I abandoned my authenticity? I would be lost in, 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 the, in the general sound that everybody's releasing. And so when God kills us, God also protects our authenticity. And so a prepared people, they are an authentic people. And even to our listeners what our, and our viewers, what I want to say to you is that this is a good time for you to pick up the things that you drop because you crave the acceptance. Mm. This is a good time for you to go back to the notes that you just put aside because you were craving acceptance. This is a good time for you to pull out the songs that you Come placed on, on the show because you thought nobody would buy that type of song right. because this season calls for authenticity and it is an authentic sound that will help us to transition this generation into the full measure of the person of Christ. And so a prepared people die to self, a prepared people walk in authenticity. And the third thing is a prepared people walk in the spirit of boldness. Mm. And what a lot of people don't understand, boldness is not something you get in a classroom. Boldness is an anointing. Yeah, come on, say that again. Anointing. It is not something you pick up in a classroom. It is an anointing. The Bible says, and then the apostle Peter rose up and he spoke with boldness. It was an anointing that came upon him. When God calls Jeremiah, he says to Jeremiah what his assignment is. And he says, I called you a prophet. And Jeremiah responds to God and he says, but I am just a child. Mm. And God rebukes him and God says, don't say I am just a child because I called you. And it is very important that we understand that because one of the mistakes that we make in our generation is that we exalt our own smallness. We exalt the fact that we are but just a child, symbolically, obviously, in that sense, uh, that we are insignificant, that we don't have the exposure, that we don't have the experience, that we, 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 we've not ran the race like other men have ran the race. And God gets up in that moment and says to Jeremiah, don't say I'm just a child. I have called you. And so one of the things that we will have to do is we will have to ask God for the spirit of boldness, because if you're going to be authentic, you're going to need boldness to own that. You will need boldness to own that. And boldness is an impartation that God gives us. It's an anointing that comes upon us where we speak with authority. And so Peter hides, but when the anointing comes upon him, Peter rises up in the spirit of boldness and he begins to release the word of God. And we see in that moment uh, how many souls are saved, how many people come into salvation. And that now sets in motion the wheels of the New Testament church. And they just cause havoc. Uh, for hundreds of years, nonstop. They just caused havoc. But it was that boldness that came upon him. So the three things that you go through as a prepared people is death to self, uh, protecting and preserving your authenticity and rising in a spirit of boldness. And what we need to see in this hour is that people that's been in hiding, they must rise in boldness. People that's not, they must rise in a spirit of boldness. They must become bold. And man of God, I, 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 had, I was pondering on all of these apostolic concepts today, and I believe that God is releasing um, a strategic kingdom partnership so that we could establish the fullness of what God has had in his mind for this next decade or the next century of the church. And in previous generations, we have seen people um, almost with, with, with a false heart um, moving towards um, joining towards events, but never had built relationships. And, 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 you know, the spirit of competition was so entrenched inside of them um, in their attempt to make their ministries grow. I want you to speak a little bit about kingdom partnership. Um, that because I believe that together the Bible says the voice of the Lord is like the sound of many waters. The voice singular is like the sound of many plural. So how is God beginning to link people up from uh, almost cross-pollinating uh, the stream that God has taken us into, where different sounds, different frequencies, different um, emphasis on ministries, different uh, backgrounds, different, uh, you know, different flows are merging into this one thing that God is about to unveil in the nations of the earth? 
that's, that's so profound what you're saying. And, 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 and I think you and I had a conversation, I think last year sometime, uh, we probably spoke almost for an hour on the phone and we were just mm. speaking about how we are seeing God bringing together so many individuals with different sounds, don't necessarily know each other from above, so, but they are connected in the spirit. And, and that is profound. And, and here's what, what I'm realizing is that in order for kingdom collaboration to happen, we should, we should be free from contending for rank. We should be free from contending for rank. What I've observed over the years, one of the reasons why we have struggled to establish kingdom collaboration is because we're contending for rank. And so instead mm. of coming together as equals, we first want to establish who's the highest ranking apostle. And thus, at the end of the day, it has sabotaged us so greatly and we have lost so much ground over the years because we get stuck on who's the highest ranking apostle, who's the highest ranking prophet. And, and you said something profound. You said a lot of these relationships were built around events. The reason why it was built around events is because, again, as I said earlier, it is a culture of sermonology where we are not building with a lot, with, with an end in goal. We are just trying to, to impress people with our latest revelation. And right. so, so events generally is built around uh, uh, sermons, uh, a fresh sermon. But when you build relationally, you understand that there's something deeper you have to impart in people. There's something more weightier you have to give people. And I believe that in order for us to collaborate, we must first find freedom from, from uh, always contending for rank. Because our weakness, as far as the church is concerned, is that we always contend for rank. One of my frustrations in the church is that whenever you try to establish something, the first question that always comes up is, who's the leader? Who's going to lead us? And we get stuck on such petty arguments and that unfortunately has sabotaged us in the kingdom. And so there must then be the recognition of one another. And here's how honor works. Honor, honor is not, honor is something that deals with recognizing the grace on another. It is something that deals with recognizing the grace on one another. And one of our fundamental struggles in the church is that we want people to recognize what we walk in, but we generally don't have the same freedom to recognize what they walk in. And this has sabotaged collaboration to a large extent. But what God is doing in this day and hour and what God has done with every significant move on the face of the earth is that he is the, the guy that, that owns all revelation. And so God, it is his prerogative who he speaks to. It is his prerogative who he pours himself out on. It is his prerogative uh, with who he gives a download. And, and, one of the things that I, that, that I believe is that when God gives a download, he has a conversation with many. But when they come together, they start sharing notes. In fact, what I want to share with you on that as well is that I had a dream a, a few months ago. And it was a very interesting dream that the Lord gave me. Uh, we were sitting in a classroom type of environment. And in this class, there were several other voices from around uh, the face of the earth, from different nations. We were all sitting in a classroom. And several different individuals was in that classroom setting. And as I looked around in the class, I could see certain individuals. And, and I've not met them in person, some of the guys. Some of them I've met in person. Some of them I've never met them. But I could see all these guys seated in the class. And, and these guys in the classroom were, were writing notes and they were exchanging notes. Writing mm. notes, exchanging notes. And, and I woke up from that dream trying to understand it. And then I realized what happened is that all of us are singing from the same hymn sheet. Wow. All of us are singing from the same hymn sheet and God is showing us also we're in the same class because all of us are now meeting as equals and we are not contesting rank. And yes. what God gave me was that, that that dream was so profound because what God was showing me is that even if you have not met him, what you know, he knows. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you have not met him personally and exchanged ideas or concepts with him, he's in the same spirit. And the reason why you can exchange notes is because you're in the same class. And it was a deep prophetic dream. And I realized in that moment that God is dealing with kingdom collaboration. And so mm -hmm. what we will see this day and age is that there will be more kingdom collaboration. In fact, we've witnessed it now the, 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 the past month on social media is that different voices are coming together on a platform and just speaking, just speaking. What we are doing here tonight, that is kingdom collaboration. Yeah. And what we are doing is we're releasing a word to the nations because we understand that Kingdom collaboration is what's going to move us forward. And everyone carries a measure, but your measure, my measure, that completes the assignment at the end of the day. Unfortunately, this is something we have not witnessed over the years. But I think the situation is almost like forcing us to get to that place where we collaborate. And collaboration requires that we recognize people the same way we expect them to recognize us. Unfortunately for us, to a large extent in Africa, and, and, you know, I say this all the time, and sometimes it's a little bit offensive, but so be it if the shoe fits you wear it. Uh, the, the trouble in Africa is that we are bound by a deep sense of inferiority. Mm. And our deep sense of 
inferiority makes us play small in a place where we have authority. Our deep sense of inferiority makes us, 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 us play lowly in a place where we have authority. And a lot of times as Africans, we think that is humility. But unfortunately, so many of us are bound by a spirit of false humility. That's not legitimate humility. Humility does not mean you do not recognize what you bring to the table. And in order to collaborate, you must have confidence in your measure the same way you have confidence in the measure of another. And I believe that is where we are. Awesome. Awesome. Man of God. Um, I, I, we as, as, as prophetic and apostolic voices in our generation, we have got to throw brick and mortar in the realm of the spirit into the future. We've got to throw something of substance into the future. The Bible says that David prepared everything so that Solomon could establish the house of the Lord in his day. So that when Solomon came, Solomon did not have to go through um, all the things that David had to go through to, to, to get things in, uh, in preparation for what God was going to do in Solomon's day. And I am seeing uh, many of the older, uh, and we bless God for the fathers in the faith. We bless God for the great men and women of God that have pioneered the Pentecostal charismatic era. But what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a failure of them having thrown brick and mortar in the realm of the spirit. I'm not talking about buildings. I'm not talking about um, natural facilities or natural uh, construct. I'm talking about spiritual things into the future so that the next generation, that's us, many of us, many of us, uh, I, I speak this for myself, we literally had to start at zero. We had to literally start at zero. There was no platform that was created. There was nothing that was created for us. Yes, I know we carried the pioneering anointing. And yes, we carried that breaker anointing to break into the new ground. But nothing of substance was given to us. Yes, a heritage of faith was given to us. A heritage of the word was given to us. But nothing was given to us to, to, for us to build. And I can look back and I can think, what took me 20 years to establish uh, in the realm of the spirit, how much faster we could have come into that if the previous generation gave us the spiritual construct that we have needed to have brought um, the kingdom out in, 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 the, in the manner and in the force we are seeing it now, how much quicker we could have entered into it. What is your word right now for pastors and for church leaders particularly um, on, on building for the future, building apostolically for the future? Yeah. Well, well, you... Let me start off with what you mentioned, and, and I, I like the example that you used. You used Moses, uh, not Moses, rather David and Solomon. You used David and Solomon. It was a very profound uh, illustration. David lived in a time of war, but the Bible says Solomon experienced all round peace. And that is so profound because his father literally dealt with anything that could unsettle his kingdom in his time. He dealt with anything and everything that could unsettle the peace that Solomon experienced. And so when we read the script, we read the script and it says, Solomon enjoyed all round peace. What we often miss is that David was a man of war. Right. So all the war that, 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 that could have possibly extended to Solomon, David dealt with that. Right. But David fought battles. And that gave him such a momentum to build because in a time of war, you cannot build. But David made sure that I deal with all the wars in my time, in my era, in my generation, so that he can have peace and so that he can build. And, and that is so significant. What a lot of us don't understand, in, 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 in particularly as it relates generationally, is we don't realize that what we fight and what we battle is preparation for another man's peace. It is preparation for another man's capacity uh, to lead, another man's capacity to build. And so what we have to, to, to really build into our system as pastors, as apostles, prophets, as men of God, and I think this is where we lose it. It's not even something deep. I think this is where we lose it. We lose it when it comes to trust. Mm. Lose it when it comes to trust. Right. And, and the problem with a lot of us is that we are so territorial that we end up trusting nobody. Mm. Uh, we think everybody's out to get us. We think everybody's out to hurt us. We think everybody's out to sabotage us. And so we never get to a place where we get to deal with our own personal insecurities and not place our personal insecurities on the shoulder of the next generation. And right. one of the things that you would have probably noticed, even in your context, is that there's always this battle between fathers and sons, fathers and mm. sons, fathers and sons. It's almost difficult to find a relationship that can run the course of time. In fact, if you do find them, it's probably five out of 50, you know, just, just, yeah. just throwing it out there. And so the problem is trust issues. The problem is trust issues. And so we will have to first deal with our insecurities because if I, as a leader, if I'm insecure, that's right, everybody becomes a suspect in my camp. Yes, yes. If yes. I'm insecure, everybody's a suspect. 
And so we will have to overcome our personal insecurities. And when we deal with our personal insecurities, then it is easier for us to plan things into the future for mm. the next generation. It is easier for us to build into the future for the next generation. And that building is going to require that we overcome our insecurities. And at the same time, when we deal with our insecurities, we are now more comfortable with trusting people. And what we have to understand at the end of the day, reward comes from God. That's reward right. comes from God. Sons think rewards come from fathers and fathers yeah. think rewards come from sons. And that creates such a massive confusion that we place on human shoulders what only divinity can deliver unto us. Mm -hmm. And so we will have to address our insecurities so that we can trust the next generation. But deeper than that also, there must be a what I call prophetic foresight. Deeper than that, there must be prophetic foresight. Mm -hmm. Because the problem with us again is we are so stuck in routine that we are trying to sustain routine and we don't look 10 years down the line. Mm. And so, so the church culture in general is what are we doing this Sunday? And when we're done with that, when that service is done, what are we doing next week? When that mm. service is done, what are we doing next week? And so the church culture is moving from Sunday to Sunday. We right. plan from Sunday to Sunday. And, and that is largely because a lot of us in our pastoral context don't have prophetic foresight. We are more concerned with creating a Sunday experience and not projecting it. Future. And this has sabotaged us greatly. And so when a young man rises up in a church and he says, Pastor, what are we going to do 10 years from now? That question will throw you off Come because on. you have not looked so far into the future. That's that right. question will bring discomfort. It will be extremely uncomfortable for you because you have not projected so far in the future. So what we need to get deliverance from is a day-to-day -day experience, a day-to-day mm. -day and project into the future. And when you look at it in a biblical context, these guys were praying so far into the future. Mm. In fact, Jesus was born. The Bible says his mom brought him into a temple and there was a priest, a man of God by the name of Simeon. And Simeon says something very profound. Simeon mm. says, I have prayed for this for many, many, many years. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's so profound that his prayer was a projection into the future mm. and his prayer was not just trying to uh, maintain and sustain the daily activities of the synagogue. But his prayers were so deeply projected into the future. And so what we're going to have to pray, and perhaps also in part in this generation, uh, Prophet Zion, is prophetic foresight. And, and prophetic foresight is not just something you pick up in a prayer room. It is something that yeah. flows out of conversation. Yes. Uh, when you sit down with somebody and you say, how far can you see? Mm. That person is able to articulate that. Now, here's the problem. A lot of us, our vision is limited to our ambition. Mm. Our vision is limited to our ambition. Right. Uh, it, it's actually led a, a few years ago, we were in a, in, in, in a pastor's conference and you know, afterwards on the break, we would just speak. And, and I, asked the, I asked one man, I asked, we were sitting at a table, I asked the man, of, I, I said, what's your vision? The man of God said to me, my vision is to build a massive auditorium in there. And, and I think he misunderstood my question. I said, what is your vision? But he was speaking about a project. Right. He was not speaking about an assignment. Come on. He was not speaking about an assignment. He was speaking about a project. Projects do not define assignment. Come on. Projects do not define assignment. Projects are necessary. Uh, we need projects. We need buildings. We need those things. In no way am I preempting that those things are not important. But what I'm saying is that we have trained people how to build a vision on mm. ambition. And we have not trained them how to build a vision on prophetic foresight. Mm -hmm. And prophetic foresight is deeper than just something that meets our immediate needs. It is building so far into the future so that the generations that come after you can experience peace. Now, peace means wholeness. Mm -hmm. uh, peace is not just the absence of war. Peace means wholeness. That means that Solomon was able to establish the things that he had to establish for God with a sense of wholeness, which means his, his dad did not give him pieces. He didn't give him something that's fractured or broken down into small. He gave him a, a season of wholeness where he was able to complete it. And so we must move away from teaching people vision out of ambition and not vision out of prophetic foresight. When God speaks about vision, it's not ambition. It is prophetic foresight. And, and go, again, to go back on your example, David had a desire to build the tabernacle of the Lord. And the Lord said to him, you will not build it. Your son will build it. Because right. for David, building the tabernacle was more about personal ambition. Yes, it would sir. be the crowning glory of his reign. It would be the crowning glory of his reign. You know, I've done all this and I've built God a house. And then God says to him, your son will build it. Mm. But it is so interesting that his son built something that started with him. That is prophetic projection. That is prophetic projection. And so we must shift to a place where we no longer teach people vision from ambition, 
but vision from a place of prophetic projection. There's a statement that I always laugh about and, and, and we always throw it out. People say, your vision must be so big that it scares you. If your vision is so big that it scares you, then you can just sit out and think anything. Mm. <laughs> you sit down and think out anything. They say, if God called for it, God will pay for it. That's yeah. not true. That's yeah. not true. The Apostle Paul had a desire to go to Rome, but the Apostle Paul could not go to Rome. God wanted him to go to Rome, but initially he could not go to Rome. And so God ordered it, but it was not paid for. Mm. And so what I'm trying to say is that so much of what we build is built from our ambition, and we try to fit God into that. When we understand the prophetic narrative of life, then we have deeper insight into certain things. And it's interesting that he desired to go to Rome. He couldn't go to Rome. And on another occasion, he says, I desire to go by the enemy stop me. On another occasion, he says, I desire to go by the Lord himself interrupted our assignment. All those things deal with understanding the speaking of God. Mm. All of those things deal with understanding the speaking of God. And there's times when God would not allow you to go. There's times when God would not even allow you to be financed. Mm. Because sometimes God is dealing with our ambition that is so strong. So what we do, we have all these seminars and tell people, uh, what is your vision? The write down project, mm -hmm. projects, mm -hmm. projects, 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 projects. Kill the ambition and then you can project into the future. Powerful. And for the last 50 years, as we round up this, uh, this conversation tonight, for the last 50 years, especially in our African context, uh, we've seen many, many people pushing um, the, the, the maintenance agenda of ministry. Maintenance. We, we bring the people, we hatch them, match them, dispatch them, we keep them comfortable, we pray for them when they need prayer, we lay hands on them when they need an impartation, we, we, we motivate them when they need it, we visit them, and all of those things are good, it's part of the church, uh, the council life that we, that as ministers, that we render to, to God's people, but there is a greater uh, revelation of, of ministry in this time, where we're moving from a maintenance platform to a transformational platform, where we now teach people from being consumers to become contributors and producers yeah. of what God wants to do in the earth. I mean, for me and for my team, I, I, will, I will ask my team, what is the word of the Lord to you? Don't come and stand on our stage and, 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 and get caught up in the corporate anointing. What did God say to you? If you don't have a word from the Lord, you cannot be part of my leadership. If you do not have a proceeding word. And this is also what God is saying. Many people had a, a, a preceding word. But they don't have a proceeding word. They, they, they knew what God said to them in a previous season. And many people are still running on the back tails of what God spoke to them 10 years, 20 years ago. But they failed to get a now proceeding word that will propel them into the next season. And, and you're absolutely correct. It's through conversation that we begin to understand where people really are. We see many people in the uh, in, in the charismatic Pentecostal era. They, they love throwing around the catchphrase that God's going to do it again. God, uh, come on, touch five people and tell them God's going to bless you. And and it's so, it's like eating candy floss. It's like eating candy floss. It's, it's full of air. Oh, but it's full of yes. We have built the church on a structure that, it, that, that, that is empty. It's absolutely empty. It has the form of God, but there's no depth. There's no substance. So we are breeding people um, that is in the 21st century church. We are breeding people that, um, that have no foundation. They do not know how to stand. Like now, everybody's waiting for their pastor to tell them to worship. Everybody's waiting for their pastor to preach, but they are not speaking out the word of the Lord for themselves. How would you speak to people that are stuck in churches like this? Because many people are trapped. They are trapped in, in an old wine skin. They're trapped in and, and they're sentimental to this old wine skin. Or how would you speak to people that are trapped right now? You being a pastor yourself, how do people make that migration? Because so many people are saying, oh, God, I'm trapped. I don't know how to go forward. I, I'm hearing that the Lord wants me to go deep with it, but I'm tra trapped in a denominational system, or and I'm not against denominations, and or I'm trapped in this old wine system, or I'm trapped in this in this uh, religious system of doing you as a pastor, what would you advise them? Well, well, let me start first. Let me start where you started. The first thing that that, that I think, and, and this is the challenge, is and, and you use the word nostalgic. The, the problem with maintenance Christianity is that people are generally very sentimental and nostalgic about their relationship with God, right. and there's nothing deeper uh, in that particular context. You would also, I mean, you've seen this, and in fact, everybody has seen this when when 
nation started issuing and saying that, you know what, we're going on a lockdown, uh, we won't have churches. That, and, and, and so many pastors for, for that regard, they started panicking about having church. And I remember saying to my guys, why would we panic? Uh, because we can't gather. Why, why, why would we panic about that? You have foundations. You have been built on a, on, on, on a sure foundation. You have the word of the Lord. Why would we panic that your Christianity will not survive if we don't meet? And that, unfortunately, is what most people are faced with is because their Christianity has become so dependent on a Sunday gathering that outside of a Sunday gathering, there's just no context for them to live out their Christianity. And probably a large contributing factor to that is that we have always made a distinction between the sacred and the secular. And what I've been saying to people over the years is that your Christianity is lived out in the secular. If you separate the two and do not understand that they intersect, if you don't understand that they intersect at some point, your Christianity will fail you when you step out of our Sunday gathering. And so what I would say to people like that is you're going to have to come to a place where you seek his face and also to a place where you trust him. Because what maintenance christianity do it, it 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 removes your faith in god and it places your faith in the man of god so so here's what i say to people is that we teach people faith but we never leave them to work out their faith we teach people faith but we never leave them so that they can work out their faith and the scripture is so clear the scripture says let each man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling and so what we do is we we we, we preach it to people but we also try to love it for them we preach it to them, but we also try to love it for them. And so what you will have to do in this particular point of time is to pull deep. It is to draw deep. It is to seek the face of God and also trust the fact that God can speak to you. Because when you're bound by maintenance Christianity, you doubt the word of God in your life. And unless your pastor filters the word of God, you don't think God can speak to you. Unless your pastor tells you that, you know what? Uh, I don't think this is God. You will not believe that God can speak to you. And so you must get to a place where you actually believe God can speak to you because God speaks to all men all the time. But some of us are so enamored with our leaders that we want to hear God through our leaders instead of hearing God directly. So you're going to have to have confidence in the voice of God and actually believe that God can speak to you. And what, at, at least in our context, what I always do is I tell the people, what, what is God saying to you? What is God speaking to you? Uh, there's times when I would even give them dreams that I have in the spirit. And I would say, you know what? The Lord spoke to me in a dream. Uh, unpack this dream for me. What, what does this mean? And, and that's a bit weird that a pastor would share his dream with the people that he are leading. But what I was doing all, all these years, I was building confidence in them to trust that God can speak to them, to trust the fact that God can teach them how to unpack things. And so God would give me a dream and I would just randomly text it to one of my sons and I would say, uh, I had this dream and what is God saying? But what was I doing, Zion? I had an understanding of the dream. I knew the directions God was putting me uh, through or God was giving me. I was building confidence in him to mm. trust that God can speak to him. I was building confidence in him to trust that God can also open his eyes to see deeper into the realm of the spirit. And so people that are stuck in those environments, sometimes we feel stuck because those environments can also be very controlling and it can make you feel less spiritual if you withdraw from such environments you will have to get to a place that you understand that the same god that prophet zion and brandon bailey have access to you have access to that god that the same god that speaks to prophet zion and speaks to brandon bailey he speaks to you too and you will have to become comfortable with trusting his voice because so many people question our legitimacy to hear God if we don't wear the label of apostle, if right. we don't wear the label of pastor, we don't wear the label of prophet. But God will speak to you. And when you get to that place where you start journaling your experiences with God and become more comfortable with the fact that God can speak to you, I'm telling you, this will be a wonderful journey. This will be an awesome journey. And you will begin to experience God in your daily experiences. But the most important thing is to build confidence in the fact that God can speak to you too. So for us, this has been our exercise. Uh, I would send them a dream that I get from the Spirit. I would randomly ask them, what is the Lord saying? When There's times when we got stuck uh, as a church and we had to hear the voice of God. And I would ask the guys, what are you hearing from God? Now, in, in, in our typical charismatic uh, training, uh, we will say that a pastor can never ask somebody below him what the Lord is saying. And, 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 and what that does is it kills people's confidence to hear God. Right. It keeps confidence to hear God. When you build confidence in them to hear God, you are safe with their faith in a lockdown. 
you know that you will come out of this lockdown and your people will still serve. It's been amazing for us. We, we're in a lockdown on South Africa. I think we're on day 23 or 24. I, I might be wrong, but we're in a lockdown in South Africa. And you know what's so amazing? People are still tiring. People are still offering. We're not calling them, following up with them, checking with them. Hello, where's your money and stuff? People are still doing these things. And that gives me the confidence that, you know what? There's foundation here. There's foundation here. Uh, so what people need to do is you have to break free. And you have to break free from the spirit of condemnation because we think that when we break free from such controlling environments that we're going to walk under the cloud of judgment and condemnation. God's not going to condemn you. God is more concerned with your soul than anything else. And if God needs to sometimes get you in a different place so that he can touch you, he will do that. He will do exactly that. And that is what I think this generation needs to hear. Man of God, tonight has been meaty. Tonight has been meaty. You know, uh, I, I can. I, th this is where I thrive in conversations like this because God is raising up people that wants the meat of the word, that no longer just wants the bread, no longer just wants the milk, but wants to progress onto maturity. And this is what this platform is. Uh, as we begin to contend for what God is saying and what God is doing upon the face of the earth. Man of God, as we close up, I just want you to pray. Um, and if the Lord releases a prophetic word to you, uh, I just want you to pray and release it tonight over our viewers and release the word of the Lord tonight. Uh, and whatever the Lord is laying on your heart, just release it tonight in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, it is in the name of your son, Jesus, now that we commit this viewers to you. We declare in the name of Jesus Christ that they will experience clarity in this season. I pray for absolute clarity, Father God. And with clarity, there comes a measure of certainty, Lord. And even as they come into clarity, Lord, they will come into certainty, Father God. They would be certain that it is you speaking. They would be certain that it's your revelation. They would be certain that it is your voice. It is in the name of Jesus Christ now that I break I break the spirit of inferiority over your life. I break the spirit of inferiority over your life, the spirit of fear, the spirit of condemnation. And I decree now that you rise in the spirit of boldness. I decree now that you rise in the spirit of boldness, that you rise in a spirit of confidence, that you rise in a spirit of self-belief, and that you will begin to interact and engage God, knowing that he loves you enough to speak to you, knowing that he loves you enough to give you a word, knowing that he loves you enough to journey with you. I pray even now, whatever needs needs you have, that the power of Jehovah will find you and that God will meet your needs, that God will speak to you in the name of his son. Yeshua, I pray this now. I decree now that you are blessed. I decree now that you are standing firm. I decree now that you cannot be uprooted from your faith. I decree now that your foundations will hold. I decree now that you are under the covering of Jehovah himself, that no evil and no harm shall befall you, that God by his spirit watches over you. I speak now clarity to your spiritual senses that you will see, that you will hear, and that you will process, that even in this season that you will know that God loves you enough to speak to you. And I pray right now, Lord, even those that are battling with sickness now, I declare that they are healed in the name of Jesus. I declare that you are healed in the name of Jesus. Spirit of infirmity, I rebuke you. Spirit of infirmity, I rebuke you. And I declare now that you are healed, you are whole, you are delivered, and that God watches over you. It is well with you and your household. The Spirit of God abides with you. No evil, no harm shall befall you in this season. And you will advance strong. As a voice of God in this hour, in Jesus' name, I bless you now. I bless you now. Amen. Amen. Man of God, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We were blessed. We have eaten from the king's table tonight. And we thank you for your obedience. We thank you for your voice in our nation and in the nations of the earth. Keep being the pioneer. Keep being who God has called you to be. We bless you, sir. Thank you so much for coming on the Prophet Speak tonight. Thank you, Prophet Zion. Thank you so much for having me, man. And we continue to pray for you, what you are doing in the nation. Uh, as you said, we go back a few years, man, and it's so amazing to witness God's hand upon your life, uh, how you have even evolved in your assignment and how God is using you as a voice to the nations. Uh, I believe, man, I believe that your best days are ahead of you and the people that serve you, that submit with you, I pray that you will stand around this man of God, pray for him, that you will watch over him, that you will take care of this man, that you would ask God that he will keep him for us. Because this man has been raised up for this generation and we ask God now that he will keep you for this generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, man of God. Thank you. We love you. Thank bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bye -bye. Bless you.
Mighty God, it has been phenomenal tonight. It has been phenomenal tonight. Come on, somebody give Jesus praise tonight. Give Jesus praise. Come on. We thank you, Father, for what you've spoken tonight. We thank you that this is not milk. This is meat. We love you. We appreciate you in the name of Jesus tonight. If you did not sow, I want you to go ahead and sow into this word, sow into this move of God. It is phenomenal what God is doing. And, and just go ahead and sow. If you are PayPal, go ahead and sow from different nations of the world into this move of God. Let the prophet speak on PayPal. Mishenta will put on um, our banking details. You can either sow through PayPal or our bank details. Go ahead, PayPal me, Zion Matthew Int. Um, it's powerful tonight. Uh, we are coming tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Listen, don't go off yet. Tomorrow night, we have got a powerful man of God from the United States. He's a revivalist. He's a prophet. He's, uh, he's coming on. It's going to be a surprise. It is powerful, powerful, powerful. Tomorrow night, same time, same place. If you did not join up our emerging voices, let the prophet speak, emerging voices, our mentorship class, uh, apostolic fathering class, join up there. Uh, Mishenta will put the be uh, with, uh, we'll put the details up there. Uh, I want you to join our mentorship class. Tomorrow night is our last let the prophet speak. Tomorrow night is our last let the prophet speak um, for a few days. God has asked me to go back and um, and, and, and just begin to uh, and regain uh, my strength and regain what God wants so we can come back. You will be connected to hear what God is saying. When God tells us to come back, we will come back. Um, but I will be coming back on Wednesday, so Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Don't miss it. Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, go ahead and register with us for Let the Prophet Speak Emerging Voices. If you did not get my book, unlock me. Go ahead and get that book. It is is phenomenal. So tomorrow night is our last night or let the prophet speak Monday night and Tuesday night. We will not be having it. Wednesday night, I will be back. Um, it's with a surprise. It's going to be phenomenal on Wednesday night. Don't uh, miss it. Mishenta has just put out the emerge details. If you want to join our private, it's not open to everybody. This mentorship school is not open to everybody. If you did not get, uh, I'll register for our Unleashed Revival Academy. That is our school of ministry. It's two different things. Uh, Revival Academy, Unleashed Revival Academy. Go ahead and register for that. The next course is starting in May. We're teaching on the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. I love you guys. Go ahead and get my book called Un lock me it is available now on digital download i love you guys see you tomorrow night same time same place it is going to be phenomenal god bless you everybody in jesus name. blessings and salutations everyone i'm prophet zion matthew and i'm so excited today to announce the debut the release of my latest book called unlock me if you've been locked in a demonic cycle you are praying and you're not getting answers to your prayer or you just feel that the heavens are brass over your life then unlock me is something that you need to get today i believe the unlock me book has truth that god has revealed to me on how you could have an open heaven access from the courts of heaven the breakthrough and the answers that you are believing god for in your life unlock me is available right here and i want you to get your hands on a copy at the end of each chapter you will be praying with me a prophetic unlocking prayer that's going to unlock your destiny and bring you the breakthrough that you are trusting god for so get your copy of unlock me available for the first time in south africa and in africa unlock me my latest book get yours tonight